Greetings, this is Jim Lindsay. This is the lesson over robots for topic eight. There's also a lesson for, ro uh, for topic eight over drones, a very short one, but this one's gonna be about robots. And so I wanted to give you an orientation real quickly as to what this, this folder looks like on Blackboard because it's a little different than what you've seen in the past. Um, as you look at this page, you'll see as you look in the, you know, the topic eight folder on the submit assignments page, um, like every other week, you see the quiz at the top and the issue analysis right there. And then as you come down here, you'll see there's a folder for robot material and a folder for drone material. You're working out of the robot material right here. Um, you're already in there because you opened up and you're watching this movie. Um, as you look at the descriptions for these two folders, you'll see that the quiz, if you read these, the quiz this week up here, it asks you questions only out of issue 15 in the textbook. We're at the end of the semester and everybody's has a lot to do right now and although this was initially supposed to include um, issues 15 and 16 on your quiz, I'm just including questions from issue 15 um, in the quiz. And so that's one last chapter you have to read in the book. So issue 15 is the only one from which I'm asking questions on this quiz. Now on the issue analysis, you'll see as you come down here and read this description, there is a lesson in here. There's a drone lesson in here. It's short, but I asked you two questions on the issue analysis, which requires you basically to be thinking about stuff that's you know presented and talked about in that short lesson about drones. And then you reflect on that, and you, you talk about those in the issue analysis. So you can't just totally disregard the, the drone stuff, but you don't have to read chapter 16 in the textbook. Um, Watching the lesson will be sufficient. To, uh, you know, the, the short lesson that's in this folder about drones will be sufficient to get you where you need to go with uh, with the issue analysis. So um, let's get started. Let's get to and in here you'll see that in the robot folder you're already watching the movie. Thank you for doing that. There are a couple of different files. There is a uh, PowerPoint presentation which I encourage you to get because it has links out to. Uh, some different resources I'm going to point you towards, as well as a Word document. The Word document this, this week is really short. Um, the PowerPoint has links to some websites I'm going to point you towards. Instead of transcribing all that into the Word doc, I just left those in the PowerPoint this time. So please get the PowerPoint file at least. Uh, also, you could get the Word document if you want. And then these are PDFs right here of different resources you may want to look at. Um, they're from places like the Wall Street Journal and other documents that require you to log in and do things that um, just add a different, you know, another layer of, of complexity. And so um, having those here in a PDF format will make those things just a little bit easier to access if you want to, to look at them. So uh, let's get started with the PowerPoint. I'll meet you there in just a second. Okay, so welcome to the presentation. And as I start, I wanted to, do, to uh, give a shout out to Dr. Mark Ciampa. 99% of the material that I'm presenting to you is stuff that I got from him uh, about this topic. And so and I've amended it and I've, I've updated it. Uh, I initially got it, back from, got it from him back you know, a year and a half ago or so, but uh, the, the basis of the information came from Dr. Ciampa initially. So thank you, Dr. Ciampa, for that. And as we get started, uh, I always like to just show you the learning outcomes and then give you a little bit of information about the authors so you can you know who you're hearing from, who you're reading, and you know whether you want to uh, provide you know put any credence on what they're saying to you. So let me reach out to those and, and show you what I've put together for you. Okay, so let's begin with the learning outcomes. They're listed right there. This starts on page it's issue. 15, it's page 213 in your textbook. And as you read through those, we're going to hit every one of those, those learning outcomes. Uh, we do a really good job actually addressing those between the presentation, between what you do with answering questions and the quiz, and then what you do with the issue analysis. I think we do a really good job of, of answering these or helping you achieve these, these learning outcomes. Um, the authors, let me just get to that real quickly. Uh, the author who put the whole thing together, the person who edited and put this 
selection together is a guy named Thomas Easton. And Thomas Easton is a teacher. Uh, he is a teacher from Mount Ida College. I believe he's actually retired now. But um, as you read through the introduction here, he, he not only did issue 15, he also does issue 16, which is the drone issue. So you, see, you get some continuity from what you're seeing as you go from 15 to 16. Um, as you read the introduction here to the yes and the no sides, pay a lot of attention to what you're seeing in the introductory pages on page 2, 13, 14, 15, because that reads like a literature review. I mean, it, there are so many in-body references to resources that, especially speakers, you need to be paying attention to that because as you read, especially uh, when you get into like the drone issue, um, you know, the, the, the text themselves, uh, while the, you know, the text themselves may not be, um, like the yes and the no side may not be uh, as, as, as citable as what you're finding from this introduction. And so really take, pay attention to what you're seeing in, this, in these, you know, 13, 14, 15, 2, 13, 14, 15 pages and um, what, what Mr. Mr. Easton has basically put together for you. Um, very, very well done. Um, as you look and try to find information specifically about the authors, um, Kevin Drum and this consulting firm, especially this consulting firm out of England, this Metro Martech, it's hard to find information. Um, and so with that in mind, it's kind of like you, you really don't want to put a lot of credence in the fact, especially like this, this Metro Martech trying to find information that they're presenting to you. but. The fact that it's so well documented and put together by Dr. Easton, um, I think outweighs that. Uh, again, all the stuff that he's he, he's pointing you to just in the introduction allows you to basically go out and corroborate all these things that are presented in the yes and the no side. So that's some information about the learning outcomes and the authors. Again, um, uh, Dr. Easton for our, not only this robot issue but also for the drone issue, that's the guy that uh, curated this stuff and put it together for us. Okay, so let me go on to the, the, go on and get to robots. And when I think of a robot, I think of this. I think of um, back when I was in college, I was a WKU student. I did a year's internship out at the General Motors Corvette plant. And part of what I did with that internship was to spend time uh, going throughout the entire plant and helping to label pieces of equipment for this thing called lockout and tagout. And so I spent a lot of time around like the welding robots, especially this one area um, where they put the uniframe together. And that's all changed, you know, since then. It, granted, this was like 25 years ago. Um, but you know, just the number of robots in the plant has just grown since then. If you've ever had an opportunity to go through any sort of plant, um, just, you know, the number of robots that are present in just about any sort of manufacturing facility is just continue to grow and grow and grow. But um, this is what I think of these types of machines. And so um, here's a picture of some robots from a Tesla automotive manufacturing facility where they're putting together the Tesla cars. Um, here's another picture of a robot that uh, is from France. This is called Colossus. And what Colossus does, you should look at the back of this, this is a fire hose connected to Colossus. And Colossus basically drives into fires and puts fires out. And this is actually at Notre Dame uh, last year in April of 2019 when Notre Dame caught on fire. Um, this machine, this robot, was used by the French firefighters to basically help prevent like the complete annihilation of the building. And so let me jump to the notes of this slide. If you look at the notes of it, you'll see that there are two links to two YouTube videos. I'm sorry, one YouTube video and then this uh, jalopnik.com website. If you look at those in a browser, this is the YouTube link right here. And I'm not going to play it because I don't want to uh, fight with copyright, but you see it's about a four and a half minute video. This is what you know, traditional welding robots, robots moving car bodies, robots painting, robots doing all sorts of things that you expect robots to do. Um, you know, you can do them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It can be 500 degrees in there. It can be 100 degrees below zero. It doesn't matter. It's a machine. It doesn't care. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't get tired. You know, robots are 
they're just machines, right? And they just they do their thing and they do it consistently as long as they're programmed well. So this gives you a view of you know your traditional sort of robot that you would expect to uh, find in, in manufacturing. Um, this page over here, the Jalopnik.com website that I referenced a second ago about Colossus, as you come down here, it shows you, uh, actually you can scroll down the page, you see some uh, some tweets about it as uh, the, you know, about the piece of equipment and then the, the thing actually in action. If you want to watch the, the, that thing actually fighting the fire in Notre Dame, that's sort of interesting. And so I wanted to show you these first because as I think about robots, these are the sorts of machines to me that, boom, those immediately popped into my, into my head. Um, but robots are much more than that. And so in addition to these sorts of things, I wanted to show you some more novel or, or a little bit stranger um, implementations of robot technology. Okay, and so I'm going to begin with some just what I think are very odd uses of robots, but they are definitely working. Um, the first comes from China, and the word for this is Chikirin. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, but these Chikirin. Uh, translation that is supposed to be China machine people um, look like this and what you find and here are a few pictures of some of the Jakirin that you would find in different restaurants and these different robots what they do when you get to the restaurant they will you know greet you as you come in the door they will um, interact with you if you look at the closely at the floor, you'll see that there are stripes on the floor in most of these places. And those are magnetic stripes and these machines run on the magnetic stripes. And you'll see that again in an Amazon facility in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, you know, in, in a few moments. But these uh, robots are used to deliver product to customers. Um, they can be used to carry things back to the kitchen. They can be used to cook. They can be used to cut noodles. And the reason for this is that uh, in the in China, what they found is basically they have a need for labor. They have a need for um, cheap labor as well. And these robots, there's an an initial an initial investment to get them. But once you have them, if you maintain them. These things aren't employees that need to, you know, make a salary. They don't need benefits. They don't need, you know, and they can work all day long, right? As long as you're taking care of them. And so these are a way for um, restaurant owners to get uh, workers, which will just work as long, you know, all day long, and you know, reliably again as long as they're programmed well, and and do a job. And so these are some these are Jakirin robots, basically. Uh, working in the restaurant industries in uh, China. Now let me give you one from the United States here that uh, maybe you've heard of. This is Flippy, and this is from this one's out of Pasadena, California. This is a and what you want to be looking at is this right here. This is Flippy back here. And Flippy makes hamburgers, and uh, there's a place called Cali Burger out in, in Pasadena. That's where this particular exam implementation is is from, and as you see over here, there's the 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 stove over here, or the the flat top griddle over here, and what Flippy is doing is it's making burgers, and they have different uh, implements you can put on the uh, the end of it here, so it can scoop stuff up and then flip it over, move it over, make the burgers, um, and it just again does it all day long, um, never calls in sick, never wants time off for Fourth of July or anything like that. It's just it's a machine, right? So this is a you know, rather strange implementation perhaps of a robot in America um, that maybe you've not thought of before. Here's another one. This is another strange one. This is from the world of sports. At this point, I think we would all watch this. This is robot soccer. And this is from 2015 from a tournament that was held as a World Cup soccer tournament for robots. Um, Japan won. And as you look at the links, if you look at the notes of this slide, you'll see that there's a link out to a news story where you can go out, you can see, you know, more pictures. And basically, there were robot uh, technicians and engineers 
off the side, over on the sidelines of the field uh, that were running the robots, and, and the robots tried to play soccer. And so, again, Japan won that competition. But those are some sort of strange implementations of robots. These are machines. They're out there. They're doing their thing. Um, everything from playing soccer to making hamburgers to delivering food, you know, to making cars. Those are several examples for you. Let me give you some software examples of of robots. Okay, so we've already talked about artificial intelligence in another topic uh, when we were talking about you know whether artificial intelligence artificial intelligence should be regulated. So you know what artificial intelligence is, and Computer systems that use artificial intelligence to interact with humans can be considered a software robot. And so I've got two examples of some software robots that I think you might find uh, interesting. The first comes from Georgia Institute of Technology, the alma mater of our, of our own uh, Dr. Marston. And both of these examples of software robots uh, have to do with a product from IBM that's International Business Machines with IBM's program called Watson. And so the IBM Watson analytics system basically was used by the Georgia Institute of Technology's artificial intelligence program uh, to create something called Jill Watson. And Jill Watson was one of nine teaching assistants that worked for uh, Georgia Tech. And there were 300 plus students in this artificial intelligence course. And as the semester started, um, these teaching assistants, what they are, they're, they're people working on a master's degree. And they will, it's, it's pretty common for people working on a master's degree to work as a teaching assistant or a graduate assistant uh, to help regular teachers, you know, do things like grade, answer questions, sometimes they'll even teach uh, sections for you. And so in this case, there were nine teaching assistants. One of those was uh, a software robot and it ran off of IBM's Watson program and it would respond to questions from those 300 plus students in the artificial intelligence program um, and it would respond with natural language. It would say, say things like yes and yep, excuse me, instead of yes, it'd say that we'd love to, it'd use contractions and things like that when it would re reply um, and it responded to over 10,000 routine questions throughout the semester. At the end of the semester, the, the program directors finally revealed to students, hey, by the way, this Jill Watson teaching assistant that you've been working with is actually not a human, it is a AI, it is a software robot that you've been working with. Um, so that's an example of a software robot. Here's another, this is, again is also uh, an example of Watson, IBM's Watson program, and I'm, I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if you haven't heard of Watson basically going on Jeopardy. They had a three-day Jeopardy uh, competition back in 2011, and Watson won. Uh, and there are two different uh, well-known Jeopardy champions that competed against Watson, and Watson, you know, basically uh, over three days beat both of them and won the the competition. So those are examples of software robots uh, being employed to 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 uh, do things that humans would do. And by the way, if you would like to actually watch some of that, in the notes I have a link to uh, an article about this occurring, as well as a video of Watson beating the uh, the human champions. And there was drama involved in it. Basically, uh, Watson didn't outright just smoke anybody, but and for a while, um, once it hit its stride, it did. But uh, if you want to check that out, look at these links. There's a story about it from PC World, and there there's some video <clears throat> that shows the actual, you know, portions of the the competition uh, between the two humans and the the software robot. Again, links to that. If you look in the notes section of these slides, right down here in the notes section, you can make that bigger or smaller, you know, going like that. So let's get back to our our next example is talk about Amazon. It's probably something that you guys have been uh, interacting with over the last uh, four or five weeks here. Amazon, of course, is a company which um, delivers things. You order it through a web page and then it's delivered to your home. 
through FedEx, UPS, or through the regular mail service. Let me just give you some information, and some of you may work at Amazon. We, there are Amazon distribution centers within our, our service area, you know, uh, up in Campbellsville. Um, when I graduated from WKU a million years ago, uh, my first job was at Fruit of the Loom, and there was a Fruit of the Loom um, distri distribution center in Campbellsville that was used for t-shirts and socks and sweatshirts and stuff like that. And, and I would go up there and work at that uh, and, and work with the people that worked at that facility uh, for my client, which was, was Target. And so um, since then, that Fruit of the Loom distribution center has been sold to Amazon and now they, they uh, put orders together for Amazon. Um, I've talked to people that worked there since there was a WKU swimmer um, named Jordan that, that worked there, uh, that it was in one of my classes. And so um, maybe some of you are from Campbellsville or you know somebody that works there. Um, here's some stats for you about Amazon just in, in the 2017 holiday season. They captured 50% of all online sales. That's amazing. So for 2017 holiday sales, 50% was to Amazon. They had 149 warehouses, um, 10 new e-commerce and store warehouses, 80 stores, and they'd all be shipping stuff directly to, to people. In order to get people trained and ready to help with this amount of volume, uh, it cost a lot. It cost Amazon a lot to do that. And they would have to basically expand the work workforce by about 40% um, adding 120,000 seasonal workers. So just, just for the temporary seasonal stuff, 120,000 extra people. And those workers would stay about six weeks, um, anywhere from six weeks to three months. But only 14% would, be, or 14 would actually become full-time employees. And so, you know, it's a lot of expense to get that many people trained. And, and the whole time you're paying them salaries, of course, and then also your you know, if they get hurt because they're new, maybe they, they don't know how to work in that facility. Um, you know, they're becoming injured, so then you're paying OSHA claims and stuff like that. It's expensive. Um, so Amazon was interested and one of the pioneers in basically getting um, robots created that would work in this particular environment. And so uh, what those look like those, those Amazon robots, what they look like, they're not anything as elaborate and cool as what you saw with the Tesla stuff. They look like this. And again, if, if I jump down into the notes here, or if you jump down into the notes, I have a link to a YouTube video where you can watch these in action. Please watch them in action. Uh, it's like, it's it's so neat, just the, the, the complexity uh, that these things operate in which these things operate is, is just amazing uh, because there are, there are hundreds of them and they're all driving and avoiding each other and picking up massive racks of things and taking them all over you know different floors of this these distribution centers 24 hours a day and they're not running into each other they're not they're not having accidents it's just it's like watching uh, it's like watching ants or something like that so again let me just jump over to uh, let me show you where, where this is Okay, so I hit escape to get to the notes section so you can see the notes. The YouTube video looks like that. And if we were in class, I would play this for you so you could see this. But again, it's, you know, you don't, it's only two, two minutes or so. I um, mean, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but just watch some of this, you know, as these people interact with these robots, they drive underneath the racks and then pick up the entire racks and then take those to the humans. And if you look on the floor, you'll see on the floor that there are these uh, lines and those lines are magnetic strips. And these robots basically can read those because there are magnets inside of the robots so they know when they're on the right road. And they drive to where they're supposed to drive. Then these, these uh, circles in the middle push up and they lift up the entire set of stuff that they're supposed to get. And they take those back to the human. The human puts the orders together and then the robot takes them back. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and it just keeps going and going and going. Um, so this is an example of Amazon using robots in their distribution centers to get orders out to us at home faster and cheaper. So at this point in the classroom, what I would ask you guys to do, and I'd ask you to vote by, you know, show of hands. Okay, so with this in mind, you know, um, Amazon has 
replaced human pickers. That's like my 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 uh, former student that was a swimmer. He was a picker, and what he would do, he would run through the uh, the warehouse that was not air conditioned. It wasn't air conditioned when not when when fruit had it either. Um, and you can imagine Kentucky at July or August, right? In a in a windowless, you know, think of the biggest tobacco barn you've ever seen in your life, <laughs> and just shelf after shelf after shelf of stuff and you're up there and you're running eight ten twelve hour shifts um just as as long as you can go um just it just wore people out right and so the fact that this guy was a swimmer he would come back to school in august and be um in really good shape and ready to to, to go with this is back when we had a swim program um he would he would be in good enough shape that he could get right back to swimming and feel like he hadn't lost too much since since the spring. So these machines are replacing those pickers. With that in mind, I would ask you some questions like this. What does this technology, what impact does it have on Amazon's hiring? What is this kind of technology going to do to the number of workers like my former student that were pickers? You know, and so I'll give you guys time to talk about that and wrestle with it. And here are the answers. The answers are the answer is somewhat surprising. Basically, there's a higher headcount of workers now than there used to be. And the reason for that is that basically the people that are there can now do stuff that humans do better and the robots go and do all the grunt work of going and picking up all the, the products and bringing the products to the humans who then assemble the orders. And then, and then you know, so you have more people working uh, and they're not having to run 8, 10, 12 hours a day up and down all these shel you know, these different uh, shelves and shelves and shelves of stuff. It's just, it's a much better working environment than, than it used to be. So robots did change things. I mean, you don't have pickers like you used to. Now you have robots doing that. But what the, the humans are doing is, is there are more of them and they're doing, you know, probably more enjoyable work. Okay, so um, those are some examples, lots and lots of examples for you of robots being used in lots of different ways. So now let's look at things that they don't do well, uh, as well as things that they do do well. Um, and then let's also look at some things uh, which they're basically improving at. And so that's kind of where I want to start is basically, you know, what are robots currently not good at, but they're getting better at? And what we wanted to get to with this was uh, a Wall Street Journal article and a Wall Street Journal video. Um, what you're seeing there is basically Elaine Bennis from uh, the the Seinfeld show, and she was, uh, if you ask an old person who ever watched Seinfeld, they'd remember that episode. Basically, she went to an office party and she danced, and it was such a terrible dance. Uh, I don't know if she got fired or, but everybody, everybody talked about how terrible the dance was. So, what? What's the, the the equivalent dance of Elaine's dance? What is that for robots? Well, um, for robots, what that would be would be having dexterity. That would be able to uh, hear well, being able to um, go from outside to inside, being able to go up and down stairs. I mean, there's all sorts of things that robots just basically aren't good at yet, and. As you look at this Wall Street Journal, and if you look in the notes, I'm going to push, force you down into the notes here. If you look at the notes here, what those look like, this is um, actually, don't try and open that link uh, if you do, unless you have a Wall Street Journal subscription, because then it makes you try to log in uh, to that, that article. Um, you do want to open that YouTube video, though. But the article itself is, you know, right there, ro Robots Learning How to Handle with Care. It's about the fourth item down, if you want to take a look at that. And it talks about, you know, like it has peeps, for example. Um, it's Easter, and people are, are, are getting peeps. Marshmallows, those are hard to handle if you're a robot because, you know, you're not a human, and if you get something squishy like that or you get something like an apple, the chances are pretty good that you're going to smash it. And so if you watch this video, it's about a two-minute, two-and-a-half-minute video. Um, it will show you how different technologies are being used, everything from different uh, materials on the end of the grippers to 
uh, pneumatic kind of things where they actually, or they inflate even, where they go and they grab something and, and where the hand would grab it, it inflates like fingers would, and then it doesn't squish it. Um, so that, that's, that's addressed in this. Also, um, as I said a second ago, as you look at some of these, these other articles here, let me get back to black. Okay, so I'm back in Blackboard. I'm going to open this one, How to Survive a Robot Apocalypse. When you look at that article, um, you know, the title of the article is basically just Close the Door. And you can see that there's sort of a human-shaped robot. That's pretty unusual. It's really hard to make robots which can, that, are, that look like a human to actually work right. Um, you know, our human bodies and our brains and all the, the nervous system and everything is, is really just a tremendous... Uh, instrument, a tremendous creation, and to make something like that out of parts and try and program it is just so difficult. And so they they don't do things like open door doors well, or fl they fall down the stairs, or because they run off of cameras, if they're outside and they walk inside, if it was sunny outside, all of a sudden they can't see and they run into stuff. Or if they walk inside and the door closes behind them because of wind, they'll start w walking into the door because they think the door's still open because they didn't open, you know, they closed it or whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, it closed because of wind and they still think it's open. So, um, you know, there's lots of things that are, that are being improved uh, with robots, but they're, they're definitely not living, uh, breathing things yet. And so there are things that uh, engineers and, and programmers are working on to, to make them better at. Okay, let's look at some financial implications of robots starting to work in the in the human world um, this is a business class this is part of the business college and so uh, we definitely want to look at at this aspect of the of the issue and so the first one we wanted to look at and, and this is all under the umbrella of the not so good of robots because um, Whereas in the Amazon instance, we basically were able to get more people and employ more people and they were doing more satisfying work. That's not always the case. Um, for example, in New York City, uh, as you go through and look at the notes here, you can look at the, the details of this story. Basically, uh, in New York City where there are car washes, um, the minimum wage rose from uh, $9 up to $15. And that was uh, just, it was mandated by law, basically, hey, the, if you want to have somebody working in, a, in New York City, minimum wage is going to be $15. As a result of that, it costs more as an employer to have employees, right? And so places like car washes, um, and if you look at, again in the notes here, it has this, you know, all the details of it, but basically they had to fire people. And uh, the result of that was the 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 minimum wage was costing so much that they had they had to jack the price of car washes up to um, twenty five dollars in order to make a profit. I'll just read you the, the stats here. Basically, the uh, before the minimum wage hike, the uh, increased wage will increase expense uh, expenses per car from uh, by seven dollars up to twenty two dollars per wash. So uh, it was it was fifteen dollars in labor to you know get the car wash, but now because of the more expense, it's going to be twenty two dollars. So they have to jack the price of the the wash up to to uh, twenty five dollars uh, in order so they're making some profit. And if they use robots instead, it brings the entire cost down from twenty two down to eight. And so obviously, robot I mean, uh, car wash owners are investing in robot technology because then once they have that that robot you know they're going to be able to keep that as long as they keep take care of the machine um, they'll be able to keep that that labor rate down at like eight bucks and still be able to charge maybe uh, twenty dollars a wash or whatever and, and continue to get customers because that's something that you know demand is elastic right and as things get tough like this coronavirus stuff is we're all dealing with that right now you know, people are cutting back on stuff they don't have to spend money on. And so you don't have to have your car washed. You still need groceries. You still have to go get, get food, but you can go buy it. You can get by without your car being washed, right? So that demand is elastic. And so they have to be as 
you know, they have to be sensitive to that and make the things as affordable as possible. Um, likewise, in another industry, which uh, is also very susceptible to um, cost is the fast, you know, the fast food industry. And just like I showed you the Jakirin from China that is being used in noodle shops and other, all sorts of other uh, restaurants in China, uh, in the United States, we now have all sorts of kiosks. Um, we have in the Bowling Green McDonald's over by Scotts, on Scottsville Road by the, by the interstate, we have these kiosks where you order your food. Over on Panera, uh, at Panera on uh, Campbell Lane, we have kiosks where you walk in and you order your food through this, this interface as opposed to ordering from a person. And so people that work those jobs are being replaced by machinery because it's cheaper in the long run to get these machines and this software in place uh, that will continue to work for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, you know, again, once you, as long as you take care of it, it's going to continue to work for you. Um, one last example, and this is from Walmart. Um, this is from a pretty recent story from, I want to say last year, late last year. Basically, Walmart is starting to implement robots for stocking. And I haven't seen these in Bowling Green yet, and some of you, I'm sure, uh, have some experience working in Walmarts. Um, it's a very popular place for, for uh, students to work. And you know, I'd be curious to, to see if you have seen this. You know, Maybe they're in the back or something like that at this point. But uh, as you look at the notes down here, here's a Forbes article which will, you know, talks about this. So here's that Forbes article. Um, it's from April of 2019, but it's talking about, you know, Walmart for the same exact reasons we talked about with the car wash and with McDonald's and with Panera. Um, people are expensive, and if you can put a machine in place to do what the human would do, then that sometimes makes financial sense. And so that's uh, three different examples of you where machines are taking human jobs, and those humans then have to then... Uh, figure out how to support themselves. What are they going, going to do differently? So now what we'd like to do is take a look at uh, some numbers, look at some specific areas we that are predicted to be impacted by robots. You know, what sorts of work are, are more likely to be automated than others? And you may be surprised by, by what you see here. And so um, one of the ideas introduced here is that uh, something called creative destruction and basically um, you know, think about when cars were invented you know because before automobiles there were horses and carriages right and so after automobiles were created eventually people drove cars and they stopped because how, when's the last time you were going around your your town and you saw a horse and a buggy probably not very likely unless you're somewhere like um, you know a Hershey, Pennsylvania, or somewhere with a with a, a community like an Amish community or something, um, where where that's still prevalent, but that's really very rare. Um, but the people, you know, so the people in the horse industry, the people in the carriage industry, the people in the buggy whip industry, man, their lives were severely disrupted because all of a sudden there's this new mode of transportation. Now it wasn't immediate; it wasn't like overnight, boom, it's done. But you know, very quickly there was a, a big change, right? Um, but at the same time, what resulted from the automobile being created was now we have jobs in for mechanics. Uh, we also have jobs for salesmen of cars. So maybe your carriage salesman, your, your buggy salesman now becomes someone who's a car salesman. So, you know, you need to think about how susceptible and how uh, likely it is that you could be automated and then defend yourself by training yourself to be as equipped as possible to to not get um, sidelined and you know become uh, unemployable and so these are some things we'll be looking at okay so let me jump over to blackboard real quickly because I want to show you one document It's called uh, this future that works a future that works if you open this up what it looks like it is a fairly long document you may want to right click it and just download it. You may want to just download the, the file. Um, it's a 148 page report created by the McKin by McKinsey and Company. Um, and the figures I'm about to show you come from this McKinsey Global Institute report about automation. 
And so if you'd like to have these for yourself, um, this is the, the place to get it. So, and another way you can do that uh, from Blackboard here, you know, a feature that works, I'm going to right click that link, open in a new tab. When I do that, it brings up this report. Now this is one of the, one of the charts I wanted to show you, talking about automation. So let's begin to, to discuss this. Um, what this report tried to do was it tried to describe, you know, for all sorts of different jobs, how much of that job could be uh, replaced by by software, by a machine, by something that you, how much could you automate that particular job? And as you look at this particular figure, I know you're just seeing it for the first time, but as you look at this, essentially what you're seeing is that, um, you know, hardly hardly any jobs can be like 100% automated, but 60% of all occupations could at least be 30% automated. So if 60% of, you know, every single job could be, you know, 30% of it could be, be handed off to a robot, that's going to have an impact upon the total number of people needed to do that profession, right? Because again, employers don't want to you know, they want to hire people as long as those people are continuing uh, continuing to bring in more revenue. That's the whole purpose of profit, uh, for-profit organizations, right? You're trying to make as much profit as possible. Um, and if you can do the same work with fewer people, then why wouldn't you? Um, and that's, you know, and, and do it as well, then why wouldn't you? And so that's what this, as you look at this, the, the information in this report, that's what it's it's telling you is that, like, Wow, that's a lot of jobs. Sixty percent of occupations could at least be thirty percent automated. I'm jumping back to the PowerPoint just so you can see this plot because it's a little bit easier to see in this format. But um, as you think about jobs which could be automated, they're not, it's you're probably going to be surprised when you look at this this chart. What you're looking at on this axis is basically how much of it could be automated on this on this horizontal axis right here which you're looking at is the hourly wage and so all the way out here um, people are making 85 90 95 hundred dollars an hour you know very highly paid people down here and where the dot is that tells you uh, what uh, that, that's a job and so looking at a couple of these an example of a very highly automated uh, job that could be you know, automated is a file clerk you know, think about if you could design the equipment, the, the robot, it could look at something and go and put that file in the right place, right? Not to mention that things are being digitized anyway. And through software, you can file stuff, you know, very easily, right, in databases. And so uh, that's an example of a very dangerous job to be in right now if you're a file clerk because um, the, the likelihood that your job can be handed off to a machine is, is pretty, pretty darn high. Now over here on the uh, chart, you see something like a chief executive. Um, they are they they are not quite as uh, able to be automated, but they're not out of the woods either. You look at this; it's probably around you know 27, 28 uh, percent of what they do could be automated. So maybe you pay them less. Maybe what as a result of that, because you don't need as many of those. If you um, you know, each company is probably going to need a CEO, but you know if, if there's something that you you could take some of that responsibility away, then you could then probably maybe knock that price down to where they don't make as much money. Um, that's not necessarily uh, you know that's that's a better place to be at than up here, but uh, surprisingly, if you look at this, you know the person uh, that may be faring one of the people faring the best is a landscaping worker, and you think about it, you know they don't make a ton of money, but the ability to automate landscaping would be really difficult because everybody's yard is different, right? You know, the shape of the yard, the land, the topography of each different yard would be different. Um, exactly what to plant in each different place would be different. You know, some some places will be shady, some will be kind of boggy, some will be really dry. And so uh, this gives you some information about, you know, some of the different uh, you know just how how varied it is when you look at professions and so let me give you one last figure from that McKinsey report which shows you 
how automated, you know, how much, how likely is it that your particular profession could be automated? Okay, this is a busy chart, and so this is one of the slides. This is uh, one of the slides in the presentation. If you want to see what this looks like in the actual report, in the McKinsey report, let me jump over to that and show you what it looks like in its real form. Okay, I'm in that McKinsey report I showed you on Blackboard, this chart comes from page seven. So you come to page seven at McKinsey report, and you come down here and you look at this, and as you look down the left side of the chart, it identifies different sectors of work, such as agriculture, mining, construction, wholesale, etc. These are different jobs, different job areas, right? And as you go across the top, it tells you, hey, here's management, uh, uh, the, the, the stuff involved in uh, jobs would include maybe management activities or expertise materials, uh, expertise uh, activities, um, unpredictable physical work, predictable physical work, you know, collecting data, processing data. As you look at these, the bigger the dot, the higher it is that that's going to be uh, automated, right? So like this dark red, like this right here, is predictable physical work. In the food service industry, as we've already seen, like Flippy the, the hamburger maker, that's a, that's a scary place to be if that's your job because there's machines coming after you. Uh, in contrast to that, where it has like the blue dot, like blue, like uh, unpredictable physical things, like let's say you had to walk out to the parking lot because something was in the, you know, machine's not gonna know to go get that particular, like a shopping cart blew from the Kroger next door into the parking lot and you have to move it. You know, that's something that a human's going to have to do. Um, but as you go through this chart, it shows you you want the, the as much blue as you can get and so as I look at this like educational services this makes me pretty happy because it's more towards the blue than it is the red and what you're looking for is you're looking for um, the least amount of threat you're gonna face from that, that automation as possible and then uh, if you're in one of these areas that's very red then you may want to be thinking of ways that you can you know, at least be the very best within your, your field so that you can stay there the longest um, or something that you might want to do as a fallback because uh, you face this threat of being automated. Okay, so there are some other uh, figures that you can see and you've got that McKinsey report, you can look at it, you can look at these slides. Um, you know, how can you best protect yourself? Well, you know, you're, you're getting educated, make sure that you're getting educated in an area that's going to be as viable as possible, as long as possible. Um, and the last thing I wanted to introduce you was just a couple of ideas that people have uh, uh, submitted about robots just as a result of this, uh, the workforce being impacted. And the, uh, the first of those comes from somebody I'm sure that you're familiar with, that's Bill Gates. He is one of the founders of Microsoft. Um, what he has said is that we may want to have a robot tax. And the purpose of a robot tax would basically be if a, some, if a company starts to have robots that replace humans, then there's going to be a fee associated with that because those people are then going to be unemployed. Society's probably going to have to pick up some slack on that, you know, other taxpayers because that person can no longer work and support themselves. And so those employers would then be uh, charged with some sort of fee for having that, uh, that machine in place to replace those people who otherwise would have uh, been earning some money. That's one idea, a, a robot tax. Another idea not attributed to Gates, but another idea that's, that's introduced is basically, uh, should there be some sort of robot to human ratio? You know, and what that magic number should be, I don't know. Um, should there be some sort of uh, limit to how much a company can automate their stuff or should they be allowed to do whatever they want? And those are decisions that as a society, um, you know, we need to decide that because, uh, you know, just like with this whole coronavirus thing is, you know, if nobody's working, um, you know, you've got like machines that can do everybody's job, well, okay that's good for the company maybe, but then nobody has a job so nobody can buy anything. And just like with like right now with everybody, uh, not everybody, but most people being out of work, the amount of income that's come in, that's just had a, you know, a, a devastating effect on the economy, right? Because all of a sudden people aren't, uh, 
the number of people that have lost jobs is 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 very high, and as a result of that, that the economic consequences that are going to be long term and it's going to be um, something we're going to have to try and recover from for, for quite some time. Um, this this other one, this uh, this last idea, it's also it's mentioned in your textbook. It's something about a guaranteed universal basic income, and with this idea, what's introduced is basically. Okay, if robots are going to basically take everybody's job, okay, that's fine. But as a result of that, if you're born and you're you're living, you're going to get a check. And exactly what that check is, I don't know. That would have to be decided. Um, and this is where I wish we were in person because these ideas about a robot tax, this idea about a robot to human ratio, the idea about a guaranteed basic income, and you know, we we do have this supposedly stimulus checks coming out and hitting people's bank accounts. So you're kind of seeing that now because this whole idea of like nobody can work, so we need to give people something to, to get by on. We're kind of trying that right now, right? Is that working? Is that going to work? How long can it work? Um, you know, if, if there wasn't the coronavirus and there were robots doing the jobs for people and companies were being successful, would it work? Um, here are questions which would be, you know, would be asked about that sort of thing. Um, so these are things I want you to ponder and think about as you guys work on the, the issue analysis for this, this case. And so um, that's what I have for you. Uh, there are some uh, other questions and facts right there re regarding the basic uh, guaranteed basic income that you can, you can uh, think about as you, you know, work on your, your issue analysis. These are sources that were used within that. And again, I got most all of that from uh, Dr. Champa. Um, I did update it, but uh, you know most of that came from Dr. Champa. So thank you to him. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that you learned something new, and have a great day.